So the scope of the project is, the, is twofold, really. We wanted to, first of all, get together to try and meet the immediate needs and challenges of having to pivot online and provide high quality online teaching of a very practical subject um, by both collating existing resources and by creating resources to fit the gap in a way that would spread the work across multiple people and um, avoid duplication and uh, maybe let us draw on each other's expertises to produce a bank of material that anyone teaching in paleo environments can draw on. We also felt that it would be really useful to be, create this sort of group to build longer term capacity. So that might include, for example, so one element of that is definitely going to be a group looking at developing some really full landscape scale VR. So not just this is a visit to a particular kind of thing, but a landscape in which you can look at many different aspects of the present day and paleo environment, which obviously will need funding applications and will take time to develop. Um, and the reason for wanting to develop these resources long term is multiple. There's the immediate need and the fact that we'll all be teaching blended, I would imagine. So with some online resources when we get back and have to accept that an autumn pandemic or fresh as COVID is very possible so that we're likely to need online materials next year. But there's also the wider scope that the range of um, computer technologies that are now available to us for online and remote learning mean that we do want to provide materials. They hugely increase access and accessibility for students who miss class for whatever reason. Uh, or for students who have trouble going to field sites or working in laboratories. So it makes it more accessible for them to understand what's going on. Um, it also uh, provides us with very useful material for preparing students for field work and for embedding practical work into, um, into the landscape, into the scenarios that it comes from, which can help engage student interest. And with concerns about the costs both to the environment carbon costs but also the time and money costs of taking students on field trips which is increasingly a barrier for our more disadvantaged students and indeed for those of us in regional universities at least we're under pressure to constantly cut costs we can use virtual reality to help us uh, and online resources to help continue to provide great stuff to students uh, without huge cost we are envisaging this project as it's covering a huge range of resources from simply sharing documents uh, through to linking to online videos or say right through to um, development of a full VR. And we're also hoping that the longer term capacity will involve us, um, those of us who are quite teaching focused, being able to involve, get involved involved in some pedagogic research in how students use these resources and what they actually need and prioritise. Um, and that's uh, particularly valuable if done in a network because so much teaching literature is based on studies of one university and therefore one kind of student in one set of environments and facing one set of challenges. So being able to explore across multiple universities again gives us the scope to do something bigger with, and spreading out the work. So as a project, we're holding this first meeting to get community input. What we intend to do is set up working groups with lots of people involved, is to set up working groups which will run across the summer. We're going to have a conference in late August, looking at the last full week of August. We'll finalise dates nearer the time. Um, so we're looking at that. Uh, at which we'll present what's available ready to go forward into the new academic year and start making serious plans for longer term work and going beyond that. And we expect that some people will be involved with the project purely as a user to come and see what resources are there and other people will want to get a lot more involved and we really want that to happen. A key element in this is going, of course, is protecting the intellectual properties of anyone who's sharing material and making sure that whatever we do share um, is done legally under, for example, GDPR for those of us in Europe. Uh, and that's something that we're 
talking to our various universities about, but it's something we want to make, sh make clear up front, it's something we're going to take very seriously. So make sure we're sharing materials properly. For the moment, we're going to use our own website, which is the WordPress website, which uh, Kim Davies put together for us uh, to start with. In the medium term, we hope to migrate that to um, someone else to someone else for longer term curation. Uh, but we'll talk more about that uh, later on. So the goals of today of today's workshop um, are for or to get community input on the things we're focusing on doing and to and on how we're going to organize the work going forward in the next couple of weeks we are those of us who've organized it and anyone else who wants to chip in we'll set up some working groups to work on materials um, because we really want this to be a project by the community for the community and essentially anyone who's interested get involved and of course share out the work because it's not like we've all got nothing to do this summer um, so the way we've organised this workshop, um, I will be occasionally looking to the right because I've got my second screen and my printer has refused to print anything this morning, so looking to the right. I think the last thing I need to do is to make sure that I've introduced um, and named the people who've helped with setting up this workshop. Um, I got nominated to speak, it doesn't mean I'm in charge <laughs> by any means. So we've got Simon Hutchinson, um, who will be looking? Who will be speaking later about the breakout groups? Um, we have got Des, whose surname I've temporarily forgotten because my brain is going. Uh, who's produced the virtual uh, um, glacier projects that many of us have already used, and we'll be speaking about that uh, shortly in our short talks. Uh, Kim Davies. Um, who's the postdoctoral researcher who you won't hear from today, but you will not see her because she's in the background making everything happen and looking after the Zoom call for us and picking things up from the chat. And Nikki Whitehouse, who's actually hosting the Zoom meeting, so again is in the background looking after things. Um, are there any questions that have come up in the feed, Kim? No, we're all clear here at this end, I think. So Great. Let's continue got any specific questions with that uh, what we're going to do is we're going to work through have three short talks about different examples of resources that are available that maybe people don't know about or might give us some ideas we're then going to take a short break for people to run off and make tea and whatever then we're going to have a session of going into breakout groups um, where we've uh, we, we've asked a couple of questions and we'll, uh, we'll give you some prompts to discuss, but essentially a chance to talk to a few other people and to um, give us feedback and input. So if somebody in that group, uh, Simon has been chasing around trying to get identify people who are willing to look to write stuff down for a group. Uh, if no one in your group's doing that, if someone could take notes, that would be fantastic. We're getting our sets of notes. Um, so we'll spend about 45 minutes on that or depending on how the timing's going uh, and then another short break before we come back together for plenary to think about what next so that's the general structure yeah use the chat for questions queries anything you want putting in or want into the record um, and that could be particularly useful if um, you're not a, you, you want to think about something or everyone is talking um, and I think that's all I need to say for the introduction. None of my uh, co-organizers have sent me anything privately saying you forgot X or Y or Z. So without more ado, I think we should move into our three short talks, which are about VR glaciers. It's our first talk. So Des, would you like to take over, turn on your microphone and share the screen? That's great, James, thank you very much. Okay, hi everybody. So um, thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks to uh, all my co-hosts. I think I've done the least amount in the organization of this. Uh, this is a short talk about VR glaciers and glaciated landscapes. I will make one or two more general points because I appreciate that not everybody's interested in uh, glaciers. So uh, let's make a start. Um, a little bit of context helps, I think. So we've used virtual field work at the University of Worcester since 2005. So it's nothing new and it exists alongside uh, an extensive 
uh, programme of fieldwork, both local and residential. And I guess a key point I'd like to make here is that virtual fieldwork is much more than a COVID-19 fallback. Uh, I think it can be part and parcel of uh, the curriculum uh, when things return to normal, whatever uh, normal will uh, look like. A number of benefits, Jane's touched on benefits of these type of resources already. Um, I don't have time to go through them all, but I would like to flag up uh, as far as VR glaciers, my own experience is concerned. Uh, virtual field work has made life much easier for me when it comes down to on campus, you know, in class activities, practical activities, and also assessments. There are other benefits that I'm happy to chat about uh, down, down the line. So what's VR Glaciers? Um, launched in 2018 um, and funded by the University of Worcester, the Quaternary Research Association and British Society for Geomorphology. Uh, they comprise 13 uh, virtual field trips to locations in Switzerland, uh, the Lake District, North uh, West England and also California. The aims of VR Glaciers is to provide immersive ground level virtual field trips and I'm emphasizing ground level uh, because it's, it's something different than simply flying through an area using Google Earth and uh, I've also emphasized the to support class and lab based teaching and learning activities. I guess I'm trying to emphasize that it's not some replacement for real field work, although I guess now it is. Um, so those are the aims. Key points before we look at the resource itself is that the approach is similar to Google Street View with its pros and cons there. Uh, I'll talk through those. It will work in almost any uh, internet connected uh, uh, device, uh, including tablets and phones. The resource is provided without interpretation. Uh, that's an issue for some people because they have this resource and they're not quite sure what to do with it, but it does provide flexibility to use at any academic level. And finally, it's a work in progress. So let's have a look at VR Glaciers now. Uh, okay, we're going to have a look at the Arola Valley uh, virtual field trip. We're going to click on that. That brings us into a virtual field trip homepage. I'm going to scroll down here. Uh, the Arola is in southwestern Switzerland. And here, there's a big orange button here that takes me to the virtual field trip. I'd just like to emphasize those other links down here as well. We've got uh, geolocation data in different formats. Uh, we've got a virtual field trip from 2006. Uh, we've got the excellent Swiss Topo website and, and other things. I'll, I'll come back to one of those two later. Let, let's look at VR Glaciers, what the virtual field trip looks like. When you open any virtual field trip on the site, it looks a bit like this. And the screen split in two. Um, this is the main view. You can rotate all around, look straight up, look straight down. The right hand side is a map pane uh, by default showing satellite image right and all those the locations is shown in orange here. And in the main view uh, that the next site is shown in yellow. So I'm going to uh, click here and you can see that it's now loaded the next view. On the right hand side there's this little radar view so you can see where you're looking uh, in the landscape. I'm going to get rid of that because I prefer it to be a bit more immersive. I've got rid of the map and I'm also going to make it full screen to give it a slightly better uh, view as well. So mindful that many of your ecologists, I uh, normally avoid things like trees and vegetation, but here we go. I'm going to go through the uh, trees here and we, it's simply a case of working your way up. It's a very clean, it's a blank tour, so there's no embedded interpretation, there's no additional data which has uh, pros and cons. We'll just go one or two steps a little bit further up. And there we go, we're up uh, on the moraine crest, looking at Sejura Nuv Glacier there, looking down in Theorola Valley, and we can uh, look up. So I'll get the maps back, um, and I can also navigate by just clicking jumping um, to another part of the valley if I want to do that, get out of full screen. So that's all the virtual field trips uh, operating in the same way. Uh, I would like to flag up also, um, you can have a look at this in your own time. Swiss Topo is, is fantastic. This opens in the, on the site, in the location of the virtual field trip. And what you can do here is, I'm going to get rid of those. Uh, I'm going to enable uh, Journey Through Time. These are old maps. 
and this is from pretty much the end of the Little Ice Age. Uh, and, and it's great to check landform and landscape interpretation, you know, with, with old maps. It feels a bit like cheating, but uh, Swiss topo is uh, excellent. Okay, um, that's the that's that's a resource. There's one or two other things that I want to say, but I'm mindful that we've got other presentations as well. Um, there is also a forum that people can use as well. And there's a link to that uh, here. So if you're struggling with the interpretation of produced resources for one of the virtual field trips, that's in Mwari Valley. Uh, it's editable with questions and answers you can uh, use with, uh, with students. So I'm going to come back to the, the presentation now. Um, so you, you've had a quick look at VR glaciers. Um, and I'd like to emphasize that there is so much more that's still to be done. Um, I've got the, the kit technology and the, you know, the capacity to capture 360 degree video. Uh, that's when it adds value. Uh, I've already got a lot of drone video that I'd like to include. Environmental audio could be useful um, or it might be a distraction. Data, this is Kim Davis at, at Bournemouth suggested that it would be useful if we could provide some vegetation succession data from from moraines, so it's not just about landforms and landscapes. It's an excellent idea, I think. Um, and there's other things I'd like to do, create models of smallish landforms, Roche Moutonnais, for example, uh, and also extend VR glaciers to look at different environments. So that's a quick look through. Um, I've not really explored everything in, in detail, but I'd just like to thank you for your, for your attention. Uh, and I'm gonna pass back to uh, Jane, I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you very much, Des. Uh, it's just the most fantastic landscape to go and explore. Um, and a, a, a great example of the kinds of resource that both exists, that maybe people didn't even know about or did know about, but uh, would like to be more involved with, and of the potential of it for the future. Um, I get to give the next talk which is about the eSlide project um, but let's first of all take questions for Des. The first one I've got is somebody asking about the indication of the amount of time resources and equipment it took you to create this resource. Oh uh, <laughs> that, that's an excellent question it's not easy to answer because I've been doing this since 2004 if you, well not continuously, um, if you were to ask me to produce something of a valley in, in the Lake District of the Alps, go out tomorrow, you know, it could be a, a day spent in the field, uh, but another maybe three or four days spent processing after. Uh, what I'm not telling you here is the time spent to learn the skills and everything else and, and the workflows at work, and that's a slightly trickier thing. So it doesn't take me too long, I, I don't think but um, as long as you know what you're doing. And to be clear, I'm happy to help people. They're looking to develop their own virtual field trips, but I'd probably prefer to collaborate with them via this project if possible. Any other questions? Um, there's a question about um, the equipment. Do students need equipment to use it? Um, presumably nothing beyond the computer. To access it via any computer that's around, I assume. Um, if, if it's equipment for a student to access the virtual field trips, then no, they can uh, use pretty much uh, anything. Uh, that's, that's very straightforward. If the question is about equipment to produce the virtual field trips, then uh, you can do it in different ways. Uh, if you're less, yes, yeah, so if you're less fussy than me, uh, there are all in one 360 degree cameras you can get uh, for not a huge amount of, of money. There are trade-offs with resolution, in other words, the extent to which you can zoom in, and also the quality of the imagery, but it's by far and away the quickest way to do that. I did buy one, and I ended up not using it. I much prefer using uh, a proper DSR, DSLR and, and all the stitching and all the rest of it. Um, yeah, so... So, so there we go, DSLR, decent lens. Uh, it's a level of detail, I don't wanna get bogged down here, but I'm happy to answer the question if anybody wants to email me after. Um, someone else asked uh, about the software you used to create the virtual trip? 
Yeah, quite a bit. Uh, the, the, the image three I, I process, okay, all right, okay. Uh, the simple answer is I use uh, something called Pano PT GUI, uh, which stitches all the individual photos together. And then once we've got those photos, we've got these panoramas created, I then bring them into uh, Panorama Tour software. I used to use Pano Tour Pro, uh, but that was bought by GoPro and then closed down, so that was great. Um, so I'm now using uh, Pano 2 VR. It was, um, and I still don't fully know how to use that, but it's potentially a lot more powerful. So um, if you ask me and you like technical details, Pano 2 VR. Um, if you're not so into technical details, there's uh, Link 3D Vista is, is, is not quite so powerful, but probably more user friendly. Those are the two the software, uh, bits of software I'd use. Um, the detail I'm not gonna go into is that it's more than just stitching together photos. You usually have to remove things like tripods and correct differences in lightings, et cetera. So and I use Lightroom for that. I'll stop there. Thanks. Uh, we've also got comments from several satisfied users who uh, say that students have uh, really enjoyed using it and they've really benefited it from using it in teaching. Um, and that it's really useful for teaching, training. Uh, there's one comment here saying, what a great resource for training students in field sketching. Um, there's so many ways these kinds of resources can be used. It does. Indeed, yeah, thanks. So, uh, well, firstly, thanks for kind comments in the, um, the, the chat box. Uh, a number of people have commented, uh, have contacted me already, which is, which is great. And the field sketching thing is really interesting because um, there's somebody running online uh, nature journaling uh, workshops. Uh, Roseanne Hansen from University of Arizona, supported by Ryan Peterson from Stanford Earth Sciences, uh, and they run these classes for free. They can't get out and about, um, so they're using virtual glacier stone Sunday there. Uh, they were using Mosdale in the Lake District, I think of all the places. I mean, it's, it's nice, but but yeah, so I, I, you can access those videos yourself. So, yeah. Great. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. Um, Comments obviously can carry on in the chat, but I think we'll move on to the next talk, which is me. So I now need to work out how to share my screen. So this is a much less, um, why does it do this? I'll leave it like that. This is a much less um, technologically fancy project um, I'm going to talk about. It's called Copal, it's the software we have, um, which is part of the East Slide project and this is uh, something that's been around for about 11 years now and was developed by myself and a colleague in a particularly difficult year when we had 60 students and only 12 microscopes and an environmental change practical to teach. Uh, we do now have more microscopes which is great. So essentially what Copol is is a microscope simulator and it was intended to prepare students for microscopy so, for example, to learn basic identification skills. One of the strengths of this is that when we began using it in teaching, we went from a room full of students going, is this pollen down the microscope to a room full of students saying, is this a grass? Which is a huge step if anyone teaches that kind of microscopy class. We also wanted to be able to replace microscope practicals where necessary. So a student who's missed the practical, we don't have to try and set up the labs and we could provide more practical work within the contact time that we had allowed uh, within the teaching model at the time. We also had the ambition of providing, of allowing confident provision of training on different proxies by someone who's a non-expert. So if you're teaching a general environmental archaeology course, that this would be a way to teach pollen counting within that, even if you yourself are a diatomist or a bone expert, uh, with confidence that you were giving the students good information and without having to mug up on a technique yourself. We always hoped to extend it beyond pollen analysis, but for various reasons, including the colleague who wrote the thing retiring, uh, we never did. Oh, next slide, please. Ah, right. So what you have here, this is what the screen would look like to the students. Um, 
this is the virtual microscope slide. You can scroll around with the scroll bars or simply by dragging. The little red items, little red circles are your pollen grain. When you click on one, you zoom in and get a photograph of a pollen grain. Uh, when you're counting a slide with different types on it, they have a tally counter built in as well, so they can record it all, uh, record their identifications in the system. That also means that the underlying program knows which image they assigned to which category. It's underlain by photographic sets, uh, so it comes with with uh, 40 Northwest European pollen types uh, with 50 photographs of each, so just a folder full of JPEGs. The instructor is able to specify the mix of pollen types on the slides and the percentage of the different types of the slide the students will see, and then that's used then as a distribution to randomly choose what a given grain will be. We can set the random seed for that choice so that we can create different slides from the same distribution, so from the same sample or level, um, and we can re always reproduce the same slide. The 50 photos we have can also be presented in different rotations and uh, we can flip the photographs so that that provides a variety of views to increase the challenge to students and to make it more realistic. When we took the photo set, or rather when Michelle Farrell, who I'm not sure is here, but uh, Michelle Farrell's um, took all the photographs and ranked them. Um, so we rank them from, for example, this is a sedge pollen that's in a good preservation condition. Hi, Michelle. And this is a sedge pollen grain that's in pretty bad condition. And we rank their difficulty and or have the capacity to allow the instructor to set slide difficulty, both to build student confidence and maybe to provide a test for students so they can self-test they start working on their projects. We also have help files built in, which have got a brief description of and sketches of the pollen grains and access to the image bank. So you can scroll through the image bank and see a lot of different examples of any given type. When you, in, if you set it up to give feedback to students, they can get feedback in multiple different ways. So they can get an error report which tells them what they identified, what they got wrong, and what, what was being mistaken for what. So how often mistakes were being made. And also gives them the option to look at the results. So um, for, you can open up a window and you get, this is what you saw, you thought it was this. So this is what you saw, you thought it was this. And then you can look at more pictures and compare and help to work out why your mistakes are. It comes as a bundle, the bundle that we've got at the moment comes with three examples set up for practicals with the handouts that you can edit if you need them. Uh, one for making a basic key from type slides, so you can set up the type slides, make the key. One of which has students work together by counting an allocated slide and then working together to create a class pollen diagram, and here's a version of it. Uh, and this is the Holocene um, in England. Uh, this particular diagram was uh, created by me, not the students, so it doesn't have the usual uh, student errors in it. But knowing what's under there will be very helpful when creating class pollen diagrams. And then there's a third practical, um, which is about exploring counting uncertainty. So it has students count a slide and record their results on a sheet every 50 and then plot out the, uh, how the percentages change as they increase count size which I think is generally useful in paleo environments. Now, we have this basic setup and it was designed to be able to add other proxies and other taxa. So we never intended to just keep it to Northwest Europe. And all we need to add is photo sets uh, to be able to either look at different groups of taxa or to even to add in different proxies. Um, which will and say so then you can play around with practicals so all we need is images which are square so 320 by 320 pixels have the same scale for every photograph in a proxy set but we can tell it what the actual scale is and in a simple jpeg format so i'm hoping that um as part of this we'll be able to get some people to um 
take pictures of things. So to do some, say, a set of common diatoms or a set of common testates or any other group that comes under a microscope. Um, so be delighted to work with that. Let me stop sharing my screen. So, Kim, have any questions come in? No, not, not questions as such, Jane, just lots of really positive um, comments here. So, um, yeah, I, oh, oh, there were a couple just coming in here. Uh, but I think maybe about switching over to, to thinking about uh, other types of microscope work, so tephra and diatoms. So have you got any comments on that as to the adaptation of it? So the basic slide software, as it is, so you can, all we need, what you need is the new sets of input files to go with it. So it's essentially that new set of photographs because everything else, um, the labels, the um, way the slides form is set by a script that the instructor writes. And there's a, uh, my colleague, Dick Middleton, now retired very sadly, um, was, his actual job was a learning support officer. So we spent a lot of time dealing with people who were very confused about computers. So he, he wrote a separate package for educators, which lets you create all that input information. Um, and the manual, there's a very detailed manual that comes with it about how to add other sets of data. So I would be delighted to work with anyone who wants to make some new toys. And it, um, seems, it seems like you have a few volunteers there from the chat. I, I can't keep, you know, there's quite a few people saying they're happy to help out with taking um, pictures of diatoms and different images. So that, that's great. So we'll, we'll collect the chat and we can, we can work out who, who that was afterwards and, and get back in touch. Great. So right, in that case, I will uh, do app students access and use through a browser, right? Um, what we students can, uh, it's not on a web browser at the moment. Um, what we've done uh, with students is we've served it in two different ways. One is they download it to their own computer or to a memory stick. And the other is um, my com local computer service put it into the student image so they can access it on any university or university computer. Um, so we have um, used it that way. Um, I haven't tested it exhaustively on Macs because we're a, we're a non-Mac university, so we, we just don't have them. Um, and there's no support for them, so we, we didn't work for them. But I, it, um, so you need to play around with Mac emulators, but it's pretty basic. Uh, it was written in uh, Ball and Delphi for those who like the technical stuff, um, and it was designed to run under pretty much any Windows environment. Uh, yeah, Nikki's commented that she has problems on a Mac. Um, so yes, we probably want Windows or uh, Parallels um, to work with that, but let's start. Um, okay, great. Looks like lots of positive comments, which is fantastic. Thank you very much. But I will hand over now to, uh, is it Canan or Canaan? I apologize for mispronouncing your name if I did. Uh, who's going to tell us about another resource uh, for another very different group for um, vertebrates, uh, the resource called Bonify. Bonify. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Janan Chakular, and I will talk to you today about um, Bonify 1.0. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, we usually Google Meet and I'm trying to find the buttons here. Good. Um, so, okay, here it is. So I will talk about um, Bonify One. Uh, we already published a paper on this uh, in the Archaeological and Anthropological Sciences. So all I have to say uh, is pretty much on that paper. And the resource is open access online. The paper is also open access online. Just one second. Uh, yeah, here we go. Um, so, um, so the aim of this project, well, the project is just one year, uh, was, uh, has been a one year pilot project. So small, small scale. Um, and the aim was to explore, evaluate, and demonstrate the potential of digital reference material for use in teaching uh, in higher education specifically and for scientific research. Uh, I'm supposed to wait, uh, do this too, okay. Um, so uh, 
from a zoarchaeological point of view. So it was um, for our purposes with the uh, zooarchaeology, especially. And then in this one year project, we focused on the famous sheep goat problem um, because these are very uh, similar species and they are difficult to identify even using uh, a reference collection. So the focus uh, was to develop two interfaces uh, to test this potential uh, web interface and um, a augmented reality interface and to test the applicability by um, questioning people uh, using a questionnaire at three locations. This was in Groningen, um, York, and uh, um, at the annual meeting of um, polar environmental scientists at the um, Heritage Institute in Amersfoort, again in the Netherlands. And um, so we have a great zooarchaeological reference collection here in Groningen. It's 5,000 uh, specimens, mostly skeletons, um, but of course not everyone has that and we tend to replace it with textual descriptions, drawings, uh, photos, if we don't have the physical bone. To make such a reference collection of course takes a very long time, to learn how to use it takes a very long time, to teach how to use it takes a very long time, but for reliable identifications, uh, especially for subtle differences, uh, you need um, these kind of reference collections or something that can replace them. Um, so, because even when we have this reference collection in Groningen, um, accessibility is a problem. We can only fit so many students uh, at one go. Uh, we have limited space and the lab is not always uh, open. And as we are experiencing right now, uh, it's potentially problematic accessibility in all sorts of ways. Um, because, for instance, our lab is closed. Um, so, to build a virtual uh, sheep and goat reference collection, we use, we had to choose first the uh, materials um, and we applied very specific criteria. We uh, basically chose the specimens that were showing that published criteria really well. Uh, for your information, yes, you, we held, had to prepare these bones. Some of them had like uh, greasing, so that would, for example, shine. Uh, so we had to clean them, so that took a while. And then the heart of the method is, of course, scanning. Uh, so we used for this um, a David SLS2 system, a structured light scanner with a camera and a laser projector. Oops, there was supposed to be a nice graph there. Anyway, so, and then you put the specimen in a turntable, you, you have a setup, uh, like a little black box, and then you scan. The scanning itself doesn't take all that much, but some of the specimens are tricky, as some of you will know who have worked with uh, 3D scanning before. And when the bone is too large or it's not fitting, then you have to fit it to make it 3D. That part is also a little bit uh, tricky. So to make the scans accessible, we use two interfaces. One is the web interface, uh, which you can access by going to Digital Bones EU. And um, this is how it looks like. I can show you in a minute as well. Um, and it has some nice features um, to let me show you right away, as a matter of fact. Uh, such as this, for example, you can put, you can measure the bones, you can put them next to each other, and then you can, yeah, obviously move them around like this, um, next to each other. So you have here, for example, the goat, here you have the sheep. Oops. Okay. Yeah, so the second is the augmented reality uh, interface that we developed. Um, so yeah, I just showed you the split screen. The augmented reality um, is also nice. It's with AR card technology and you wear the goggles. Uh, it has advantages like you don't need internet and we really wanted to do this because we work in places like Iraq, Southern Turkey, 
uh, or very remote places in Bulgaria, I don't know. So uh, we don't have always access to the internet so easily, uh, but it has also disadvantages like there's no split screen and so on. And the resolution is uh, relatively low, but people love it. Uh, that's another thing as well. I'll speak about that in a second, uh, which the questionnaire also uh, sort of shows uh, what was successful, what was not. Uh, we had a pool of students, uh, mainly from the Netherlands, but also York, so international students as well, and practitioners uh, from different expertise levels with um, various varying degrees of access to physical uh, collections. So what they told us about the user friendliness, for example, was that of course they loved the physical collection. The website was also fine and very useful. Um, and then the uh, augmented reality, not, not so much. And that went also for the usefulness uh, of it. So, um, which is a different question, it's like can you actually identify your sheep and goat uh, by using these technologies? And the general rating was also, of course, reflecting these, uh, which people favored the uh, seeing and the rotating images, the 3D images on the website. Um, so in conclusion, these are, this is our reference collection, by the way. Uh, yeah, in conclusion, uh, the both the website and the um, augmented reality have a great potential for development. They also work uh, with, if you have prior experience, especially like if you have worked with a physical collection before, if you were taught before, so you're, and the, your problem is not accessing these resources or you're doing advanced um, material research at home, you're a master student, uh, MSc student and so on. So uh, it works really well, uh, but the augmented reality, not so much. But we had great success in outreach events with the uh, augmented reality uh, aspect. And as technology gets better, uh, we see great potential there as well. And I think some of the um, outcomes of the questionnaire actually points, uh, reflects the fact that most of the people we questioned have usually physical access already to our wonderful collections. Um, so I think that was part of the problem and that's where I can stop. Stop share, yes. Yes, thank you very much. Great, thank you. That was really interesting and I think it also um, reminded us of another potential area of use of these in outreach and in encouraging people to see how interesting uh, our subject is and get a feel for what we use. Um, do we have any um, questions about the Bonify project or comments? Simon's uh, asking about the budget, Jane. How much yes. does it cost? Yes. So how much does it cost uh, uh, um, both to create the scans? And I'm also interested in in the AR problem and how much it costs to actually be able to have enough kit for a class to use them. Right. Uh, so we had a basic budget of about 15K, 15,000 euros. Uh, and but we had also uh, in kind like uh, support staff, technical staff support. Uh, so there pe people working on this already with salaries. And then we also had extra uh, support, equipment support from the faculty. So all together, I would say uh, with the writing and all, maybe 25,000, mm -hmm. everything, equipment, staff, uh, time, there were student assistants and everything, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, actually, the other thing is about the augmented reality setups. I know that's an issue some colleagues here find who are doing um, flooding outreach is that 
the headsets and so on are great, but it's having enough for people to use them seriously in class or something is a bit of oh, a Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, that can be very costly. We, um, we have one uh, through the project. We have only one. No, we had, so we were rotating, like uh, uh, students were using it one by one. And then if we want, I think we can borrow some from the CIT, the IT department. But no, um, indeed, it's a, it's a thing, yes. There's a question here about whether the feedback you got on it was from the public or students or specialists. Right, students and specialists. So both like uh, bachelor students, students at uh -huh. all levels, PhD, postgraduate and um, specialists too, yeah. It's a mixed group. In the paper, there's, there are more details about who we asked and who said what. Great. Uh, one more question, I think, before we have a break. Um, uh, and hominid yes. remains. Um, yes. Well, I think there's scope in this uh, because we, we already have the ba basic setup. I mean, it's about raising more money and uh, well, we've always prioritized the archaeology, <laughs> uh, but why not? Of course, I mean, um, you can do basically any any bone. You can also do shells. That would be interesting. Oh, that would be very really. interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've just put a link. Put the doughy for the paper in. Uh, yes. So someone asked oh, the about link the to the tape. Yeah, the, the paper. Yes. Um, yeah, it, I have it open here. Um, someone asked about the size of the scanner, so how big a thing you could put in it. Uh, yeah, that's also a super good question. The um, really small bones, the flat bones in the um, uh, David scanner, they, doesn't, they don't do really well. So you might want to try another technology like photogrammetry and um, uh, also lithics, for example, I think they will be s s potentially small and flat. And of course, some of them will be really big. Uh, yeah. Start video. You're not seeing me, are you? <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, so uh, the point is the small and flat objects don't do really well in this particular scanner. Uh, and I, I think photogrammetry also. Mm -hmm. Um, well, thank you very much for that. Um, I think I'll put it in the chat. The uh, we're the, trying to keep paper. our timetable. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Things in. But great. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone. We will take a ten-minute break to run off and refresh cups of tea, uh, etc. And then we will come back to discuss some of these ideas more in the breakout group, which will be. We're back at um, about 10.40 and Simon will introduce us to the breakout groups, but do keep putting things in the chat if you want to. Uh, Kim, would you like to put up the uh, holding slide? Thank you. It's great to see so much enthusiasm. Uh, and the important thing, I think, is to find ways of uh, taking this forwards. Um, so um, I think lots of great ideas. And what's really reassuring to me, at least, is that I'm seeing different groups repeating same ideas that I've come up with, which suggests they're actually good ideas, which is brilliant. So going forward, today's uh, recordings and slides uh, for people who are willing to share their slides um, will go up onto the project uh, WordPress site which we've got the stub of now to start growing it. We will take a digest of the chat and of all the sheets um, that the different group leads have filled in and pull out sort of the main ideas and questions and so on uh, which will then and, and from the grids and the suggestion of the working groups so we'll talk as a work group and we will send that and everyone uh, on the wider list, so people who couldn't attend today. Um, and from that, we'll suggest um, 
as a set of working groups and we'll do another i think the sensible thing will be to do another form through the website where people can actually sign up for which group do you want to be part of and then the groups can go off and get on with their own things uh towards august um so the intention is they to put everything together send it out by sort of the first of june and um, there's definitely going to be a subgroup whose job will be to coordinate everything to make sure the website has a sensible structure and is easy to submit to and so on so um here a couple of um so two routes for getting information really one is to use the website as a comment form use the comment form or email me directly because i'm coordinating all the bits and pieces through the comment form at the moment so if you're sort of emailing um so if you can email me uh, my email was in the chat it's m.j.bunting at hull.ac.uk or use the contact form on the website which is to say is always there you don't have to worry about remembering it either to volunteer to do specific things or to add to the comments with things that you thought of um, so the break uh, the forms from the breakout if you send them to me as well which is jane bunting uh, or you say if you send them to anyone on the monitoring team on the on the team at the moment uh, reply to one of the emails and they'll get them back to me um, so any volunteering or suggestions um, so yes um, so we'll aim to get the collation and to send you another email by Monday next week so the 1st of June about what we're doing with the idea that we'll then have the form of these are working groups volunteer which we can then publicize a bit more widely um, so that we working groups can get going the following week is the hope so in early June and the intention is to have another uh, forum probably over a couple of days probably using afternoons rather than mornings so that um, the many north american people and people in time zones behind us who signed up as interested can attend as well as people ahead of us um, probably it's over a couple of days to both present this resource and discuss everything that's going that's coming next so aiming for another meeting in august um and i think it only remains to me to say thank you very much for everybody's contributions um particularly to kim and nikki for keeping the website going and charging around behind the scenes in and out of rooms and to uh, des and simon for helping with all the paperwork and things and um simon for nominating me to actually do the talking bit on the front <laughs> everybody knows i like talking so we should also well, I specifically. Sort of thing. I hope you've all enjoyed it today. Simon? Sorry. Simon? I was just going to say thank you very much. Thank you to all those people who at the last minute responded to my pleas uh, to be to be leaders of the groups. I'm not sure what group you ended up in, um, but we kept bobbing in and out, or Nikki did, and all the groups were chatting nicely. Uh, we don't know what you were chatting about. Hopefully it was about this, but uh, thank you to all those who stepped up and, and, and please don't forget to send the forms with, with all the important information that you collated. Thank you very much. Great, and I hope everyone enjoyed the chance to actually talk to each other about teaching instead of being lectured from above about the marking we haven't done um, and to think in a positive way about what we're going to do next year and, and for the future to make better resources for paleo environments. We're going to leave the Zoom room open for the next probably uh, 20 minutes, half an hour, if people want to chat or to keep putting things in the chat box. But I think I can now declare us officially closed. So thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Jane.